In this video, I'm going to walk you through how to effectively read a scientific research article. And the first thing I'm going to do is introduce you to the software that I'm going to be using to um, walk you through how to read a research article, and that is AFRI. And AFRI is actually sponsoring this video. So within AFRI, it's a reference manager that has a lot of AI features built in. So this is the article that I'm going to be looking at, and I have a different video if you want to learn more about AFRI altogether. Before I jump in, I want to make sure that you know that you can access AFRI using the link in the description below, and you can also use this code if you would like to get 10% off if you choose to upgrade to the paid version of AFRI. So I'm going to double click on this article to open it up. And this is going to open up the file that's already saved within my account, and then I can go through and use FRI to annotate it and to work with AI throughout reading this research article. But the very first thing we want to do isn't about software and it isn't about just diving in and starting to read the research article. The first thing we actually want to do is set an objective for reading a research article. And essentially that means why do we want to read this research article? And there's a few different reasons you may want to read a research article. The very first one is that you might need to find or learn a method. So you've created a research question and you know what you want to study, but you're not quite sure how to study that or how to analyze it. And so you might just want to find a method that you can use or learn a protocol for a given method. And if this is what you want to do, then all you need to do is go into your results, find whatever method was used to generate the result that you want to generate, and then go back to the methods and learn about the method and the protocol that was used. Another use case for wanting to read a research article is just to identify the key findings. So you might be trying to get up to date on the research in your field or answering a very specific questions about what results have been found up to this point in a certain question. And if you're just trying to identify the key findings, then a great way to do that is just to go to the results sections and look at the different figures that you're interested in and identify what their key findings were. Another option is if you're trying to find gaps in the literature. So you're trying to find a new research question, what should you study? A good place to start there is to look at the conclusions and see what future work is suggested and also to look at the limitations of a paper. And then the big one that we're going to discuss today is if you're trying to actually understand the research article. Maybe you're initially starting out in your field and you're wanting to really understand the full research article. Maybe you have to give a presentation on it. There's a lot of different reasons why you actually want to dive in and do a deep dive in understanding the full research article. And that's what we're mainly going to get into today. But I want to talk about one case that really doesn't suit well with reading a research article. And that's if you're trying to figure out background information on your field. If you're like trying to figure out what a protein does or general background information, I want you to stop looking at a research article and instead try and go find a review that really covers that. You're going to tend to find much better quality information if you use a review instead of using a research article for that general background information. So whenever you're trying to understand your research article in more in depth, or if you're using any of the other objectives I talked about, I want to go through how to read the different article sections so that you know exactly how to approach it. So whenever I'm looking at a research article, the very first thing I'm going to do is look at the abstract here. So you can see this abstract goes from about here to here. And what I'm looking for is just to get accustomed with what this research article is talking about. I'm also looking for reasons why it may not be a good idea for me to spend my time going into deep depth into this article. Maybe it doesn't, I thought it matched what I was wanting to read about, but it really doesn't match what I was wanting to read about. And so I just start with the abstract and figure out, is it really a good fit for me and what I want to do? After reading my abstract, what I'm actually going to do is jump all the way down to the conclusions. And you can see here's my conclusions here. This tends to give a little bit more of the results and discussion parts of the paper instead of more of the introduction methods that tends to be in an abstract. And so I read this to understand again, is this important to my field and to go ahead and understand what are the main key findings that they found. So I have that context as I read through the results, figures, methods, and introduction. After the conclusion, what I'm going to do is actually look at all of the figures. So that's a good way to learn the story of a paper is just to look through all the figures. Now, once you've gone through the figures, the next thing I would do is if you are at a certain figure and you have questions about it or you're wondering how they got there or anything like that, 
I would then go into the results and actually read the words, but I would actually start looking at the visuals themselves and that can actually give you a lot of information, whereas reading the words can sometimes get really confusing and make you feel a little unsure of what they're trying to say. So if I want to understand the context behind some of these results or any competing results, I would go into the discussion. That's where I'm going to get a lot of why is this happening, not just what is happening. And then the final thing I'm going to do is look at the methods and introductions, but only as needed. So if I need to understand how they generated results, I'll look at the methods, especially if I wanted to duplicate the study, which I actually did. I looked at the methods to figure out what were they using, how did they create their solutions, um, and what results were they getting. And then if I'm not understanding abbreviations, if I'm not understanding basic background information about something that they're talking about, I'll go up to their introduction and then kind of read about what is important and what um, that abbreviation was or what that background information is. So this is why I don't start at my introduction because typically a lot of the information from my introduction, especially if I already know my field, is really redundant and it's kind of a waste of my time to read in depth an introduction when it's not completely related to what I'm actually trying to work on or we're trying to learn from this article. So as I'm going through reading this article, I wanna talk about how you can annotate your article for your future self to really thank you. And so this is one of the things I really like about using FRI because they actually have a really good annotation system that's built in. So I'm going to show you the different ways you can use their annotations. If you're in a different reference manager, you can also use those annotations. But I really like the way that they do it within FRI. So the very first type of annotation is highlight. And if you've seen previous videos on my channels, I basically talk about how I really don't recommend highlighting. And FRI has actually changed this um, and how I feel about this. And the reason why, so if I come up here, you can see I can click on this pencil and it's going to do a text highlight. I can also actually just use the keyboard shortcut and hold down S and T and you see it brings up that highlight there. What I like about highlighting within FRI specifically is if I want to be able to access information within the paper really easily in the future. Let's say I have this statement here. Without addition of any modifiers or salts, the major ionization species observed for each compound included the M plus A and the 2M plus NA. So this is actually something that's really important for us to understand is that even without adding insults, we're still getting this sodiated species here. And let's say I want to, I want this to be something that I want to remember about this paper is that they didn't add in sodium for it and they still got this. So what I can do is I can highlight this and it's going to highlight with it, it with a color. And if you have like different topics that you are trying to work with or something like that, or even different, like maybe red is going to be for my results and blue is for my background information I want to know and green is for future work that I want to have easy access for. Um, that's one way to categorize it. The reason I like this, because generally if you just highlight, especially if you highlight on paper, when you go back to that paper, especially if you highlight a lot, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It just, just highlights all over the place and nothing really stands out. What I like about this is it actually extracts the text and it puts it in a note. So I can see this exact text within a note now. And what that also means is if I look for, if I search M plus NA, Within this, this still shows up because it has that note within it. So if I click on it and go to my notes, you can see it has that note within it now. And so this makes it searchable. Now I can take text and automatically make it searchable for later. And that's one of the things that I now would use highlighting for, even though I really discouraged that in the past because I hadn't found a software that had this specific feature in it. The next component of annotating is highlighting with comments. The way that I would use comments with highlights is to be able to ask questions or leave thoughts about the highlight that I did. So for example, if I had this highlight, I might come in and ask the question, how common is it for sodiated species to show without sodium added? And so that might be something for me to investigate later, but I'm writing all my notes down in here so it's easily accessible for me in the future. The other thing is if I had thoughts, so if I wanted to, um, maybe I'm gonna add another comment and also say like sodium can be prevalent even in deionized water 
and potentially causes sodiated species. Something to that effect, I can do that. And so again, that's just like a thought that I'm having in that moment. And so that's a way for me to easily write it down and it's all available for me and searchable. The next type of annotation is to take notes. And so what's nice about this is there's two ways that you can add notes in. You can add a quick note just by using the bar down here within FRI. And you can also add a sticky note. So if I click on this and added a sticky note in here, I could add my comment in here. And so a few ways to use notes is overall ideas. So like if you get a research idea, you can do it like that. Comments, questions that you have overall about the paper, and then thoughts for a specific purpose. So if you're like want to include in and then talk about what how you want to use that um, this paper, that's another way to do notes. So if I wrote a note on this, separation differs for different species of isomers. So this is just kind of a general note that I might want to add. It's something that if I need it, I can search for it and I can come back to it later. I can also potentially write note about research ideas. And if you're going to write something like a, about a research idea, I would have a specific prefix to it. So like research question. And then I would add in what my research question is. So how does group one metals affect the separation of isomers. The reason I'm doing that, oh, let me press enter to actually add it. So there it is there. The reason I'm doing that is if I come back in here and I go to my notes, I can search my notes so I can search for what research questions I had. Um, I can also change the color of this note. If I come up here, I can make this blue so all my blue ones are research questions and things like that. And I can also, if I have a lot of papers and I just wanna see which ones have research questions in them that I have created, I can also include that up here as well. And so if you also have like uses, like I wanna use this in something, I would say use, and then I would say like introduction of group one metals paper, something like that. So having these prefixes within your notes, especially if you always start with them, is a good way to be able to find them later on. The two other annotation methods is, first of all, capturing images. So let's say this is an image I know I'm gonna want easy reference back to later. What I can actually do is use the area highlight, and I'm gonna capture this image so that whenever I come to this paper, I can really easily, if I exit out of that, I can really easily see this image here and if I want, I can make copies of this image and just being able to like know the different images without having to go in and relook at the paper, that can be really helpful. The final way to kind of annotate a paper is actually not in the annotation sections, it's more of an organization technique, but it's the ability to add tags. So if I wanted to add a tag, I can go into my info, click add a tag, and then click on steroids and go ahead and add that in. And specific ways you can use tags is to mark out methods, specific results, um, analyze topics or themes that you're interested in, and even uses for it. So I could add a use for a different paper that I'm working on, that way I can filter down to just the papers that I'm interested in working on for like, if I'm writing a specific paper or for my dissertation or anything like that. The final thing I wanna talk about is how can we use AI to read our papers more effectively? And the very first thing we can do is actually work with it to explain things that we don't quite understand, either phrases or anything like that. So if I come up into my introduction here, so let's say take this sentence here. So this says, um, this is especially true when dealing with epimers that differ only in their stereochemistry. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a highlight and I'm gonna copy that. And then I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna go into my comments and I'm going to type in at, and this gives me access to the AI chatbots. I'm gonna use this one and I'm gonna say, can you explain, can you explain this selection? So it talks about epimers. So epimers are one type of stereoisomers that only differ in the configuration at one specific chiral center. Um, that means that the overall thing is very similar. It talks about what CCSs are, the challenge with epimers, the implications, 
and the strategies to overcome the challenge. And so that's kind of pulling from the paper. So it gives me a description um, of what's going on and it can kind of explain a little bit more and, and simplify things for me. The other way to use AI is to get an easy summarization. So if I come in here, I'm gonna do at to get the AI model up and then I'm gonna make a note saying, please summarize this article including the methods, key findings, and future work. And so you can see this pops up here. And so it gives me the summary, the abstract, the methods that they used, the key findings, and the future work and a conclusion. So it gives me a really quick summary of it and now this is now saved as a note so I don't have to copy and paste it anywhere. It's already saved within here. And the final thing is to use it to identify limitations or future work. And I kind of did that in my previous one. So it says the study suggests further exploration um, using DTIMS to uh, provide the analysis of isomeric steroids and the potential use of different cation addicts. So I might come in here, I have to add in my AI chatbot. So then what are the limitations of this study? And I can go into its comment. So you see it gives me several different limitations um, of the study and then I can take a limitation and make it into a future work. So I hope that gives you an idea of not only how to read a paper, but how to also annotate it and organize it in order to be able to find it easily in the future. And then also to be able to use AI to make it more smoothly and be enhance your ability to read it. If you are interested in FRI, I will leave a link in the description below. You can also use the code right here to get 10% off of your purchase for FRI if you would like to upgrade um, to get more of the AI features and more uses of the AI. I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.